On a recent morning at the Occupational Health Clinic of Cambridge Hospital in Massachusetts, doctors and technicians screened a group of 30 workers for early signs of lung damage from asbestos exposure. Oh, great, good, keep going, keep squeezing, that looks great, keep going, this is the best one so far, keep going if you can, keep going if you can, keep going if you can, a little bit further, a little bit further, it's still climbing, it's still climbing, keep going if you can, keep going if you can, a little bit further, okay, stop. Great. It was part of a program worked out between their employer, the Massachusetts Department of Public Works, and their union, Service Employees Locals 285 and 5000, NAGE. Uh, as you're going to hear, uh, smoking is one of the things which, along with asbestos exposure, can increase your risk to some of the asbestos-related diseases, specifically cancer. They were mechanics for the most part, who worked on the fleet of state trucks, snow blowers, cars, payloaders. Some were brake mechanics who'd been exposed to airborne asbestos dust blown out of old brake drums. A lot of people that have worked uh, in, the, in the department here, especially in the garage for the last, say, 20 years, that have been doing the same, same brake and clutch work, and they never realized the, the problems with asbestos. Alarmed about this practice, union leaders Joe McKay and John Mullen convinced their employer to hold education sessions about the hazards of asbestos. It would take a million asbestos fibers to fill up that same inch. Steve Schrag, one of SEIU's regional health and safety coordinators, was called in as a panelist. Many people don't act on the, set, the hazards they face at work because they either believe it's always been that way and it always will be that way, or they think there's no safer way to do the job. Schrag discussed encapsulating equipment on the market that completely encloses the brake drum and through a vacuum sucks the asbestos dust into airtight containers preventing the escape of tiny, dangerous fibers. Members came up to me after the training session and asked me, well, what, what should we do at this point? And I basically said, well, you do, in fact, in your contract, have the right to refuse dangerous work. After the session was going on for a while, the, the mechanics and the people involved who work with asbestos said that, you know, until we get the proper equipment, we cannot um, you know, expose ourselves. And when they realized that they didn't have the proper equipment, the proper masks, the proper encapsulating machines, they just stopped. And, and this happened all across the state. Almost one garage after another stopped doing this. They virtually put down their tools. But the thing that happened here was so great. After the training, the first couple of days, there was one individual who um, grabbed an, an air hose and tried to blow out the, the brake drum. There was ten guys there within one minute, and they were going to, you know, they were going to give them hell. But um, that's what happened. It takes things like that. It takes peer pressure, and um, we had it here, and it really worked. It's always a pleasure to tell our people not to do anything until the safety equipment is there for them. And if the foreman don't like it, that's too bad about them. If they can go out and spend all kinds of money on, on, on parts and equipment, what about the people that are, that are using that particular type of thing and doing the job for them? Bottom line shouldn't be money, it's the safety. The work stoppage succeeded. It had the support of some middle-level managers who were alarmed themselves after learning of the long-term damage asbestos can have on the lungs. The Labor Management Committee met again and came up with a plan. And within six months, the encapsulating machines were installed. Our members, by taking direct action, created a crisis that management had to solve. And they solved it. And in six months, those machines were delivered. That's pretty unheard of when it comes to state bureaucracies to move that fast. You can go and look back uh, and say, well, why didn't we do it five years before? The fact of the matter is, when we started to work on it, through the interests of the union and through the interests of the management, the management um, carried the ball, uh, got up the money, and it is a fairly expensive proposition and hard to work things through the budget process in a, in a governmental unit. And uh, I think our management deserves a lot of credit along with the people in the union. The day the encapsulating machines arrived here, it was, um, it was like a 4th of July celebration. It was really terrific because uh, a lot of people were so skeptical for so long. But, uh, they realized that from sticking together and, you know, really standing tall that, that this would really happen. It was something that it made them feel good. It was showed, you know, real unity, uh, strength within the union. If you're saying to yourself, well, that could happen in Massachusetts, but it could never happen where I work, think again. 
The local at the DPW had never had particular success on a health and safety project before. They were cynical about management's intention and perhaps their own unity. But they worked through a structure already in place, a labor management committee, and they called in the international to back them up with on-site workplace inspection, with educational materials, with technical expertise, especially about the equipment, and through educational seminars for leadership and members. And they used the law. 